And we're on. Welcome folks. In a world of chaos and mayhem, welcome back to the Bailey Workshop for guitarmaking.co.uk channel. Um, today we're going to be talking about sanding. Last week you saw me carve this guitar and uh, on Wednesday actually we did the dishes. So you've already seen one of my little sanding machines. And today I'm going to show you all of my um, sanding widgets and gadgets and also how us mortals would do it by hand. So um, I've got some great sanding bits and bobs to show you, but um, mostly I'll be um, 
working on Roland's guitar. So this is 200 year old piece of... 400 year old. 400? Yeah. I thought it was 200 years. No, that's the other bit of wood is 150 years. Right, yeah, I get confused. Yeah. What's 200 years between friends, eh? So this is 400 year old walnut from Glastonbury, imbued with all the goodness um, and uh, saved by Roland, brought here for me to make a guitar out of. So it's pretty much there, uh, body wise, um, I'm, I'm ready for sanding. So um, obviously sanding is the, the reason is to get rid of all these rough scratches. Um, that you get when you're carving and what's really important although this sounds stupid is making sure the flat bits are flat and the round bits are round so it, it does sound a bit um ridiculous but what i mean is that on a on a flat area there should be no bumps no lumps and bumps likewise on a curved area it should feel smooth with no lumps and bumps on it. The reason is that if you're ever going to spray this guitar, then you need to do what we call um, flat sanding. You're trying to get it flat like a mirror flat, proper flat, um, so that you can see your reflection in it. Um, so if you've left any little lumps and bumps, when you're cutting back that lacquer, then you'll end up going through it on the high spots. You'll end up with a bare patch of wood. Now, if you've got colour involved, that can be a complete nightmare. Um, so the reason to get the flat bit super flat is to avoid rub throughs. Uh, and the same thing goes for the curved bits. If you've got a lump on your curved bit, you're much more likely to rub through on it. So flat bits flat and the round bits round. You've got a quick question. We've got questions about, uh, already. Brilliant. Well, there's lots of these, but, um, Any questions, guys, just leave them in the comments. Carol's, Carol's operating the master controls over there. So... Uh, <laughs> So uh, she, she's going to shout out your questions if you've got any. Right, so Simon's channel. So Simon's channel apparently uh, sanding today. is sanding today. Right, so, but, but what his question is about about Roland's guitar. Timing's everything, eh? Like what he's what he's saying is, um, did you have you done any round and over in, on the top? Um, Not at all. Thing? No, right, it's been carved. Obviously, you can see the shape. You can see the shape of the carve there. Um, if you're not, if you want to know how I did that. Then um, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm building a playlist. So um, this is part, what was it, part eight, sanding. And there's about um, three or four more to, to do. I think I'm going to put clamping and gluing in the same one. But I want to do soldering. And um, I've got one about levelling, like getting it straight, which goes for frets and um, bits of wood all kinds of things, getting something flat and level. So that's three. And maybe um, putting frets in might be another one because there's various different techniques to actually whack frets in. So anyway, what I'm trying to do is put together a playlist of basic guitar making techniques. We're up to number eight, sanding. So I've completely forgot what, what the question was. He just asked you about rock rounding over. Did you round any of that? The top of yeah, the so um, on the last one I did carving, on this one we're doing sanding. So um, the question was, did I do any rounding over? Um, only on the back I used a router. You can probably see this is, uh, this is rounded over using a, um, I'll show you the cutter I used. I did this this morning. So the only rounding over I did was on the back. I want you to bear in mind guys, today we're focusing on sanding, okay? So it's not finishing. I'm not um I'm not gonna be able to go into all finishing details and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'll do my best to answer all your questions. Well, there's a good there's a good question for this point now then. Go on then. Uh, e EP said he's not sure what a rub through is. Like, okay, a rub through. Happen? Um a rub through would be um when you're spraying the guitar, let's say, uh, let's 
Let's say we wanted to make this guitar. Whoops, look how bright that is. It's a bit too bright, change the camera. Let's say this is maple, which is quite white. Let's say we wanted to make it um, purple like this. Um, then we have to put, we have to put stain on and then we have to seal the stain in with a finish. So it's very thin. Um, actually the skill of a finisher is getting that finish as thin as possible, but still mirror flat. We'll get into that at a later date, not today. But there comes a point where you, when you spray, you might get a run or, you know, it's never perfect. Even if your wood looks perfectly flat, there's still grain. And when you put your finish on, it amplifies everything by five. Imagine a drop of water, how a drop of water magnifies everything by five times. It's a similar effect. So if any little, um, even tiny little pores in the wood or any tiny little defects um, will be magnified hugely. So you end up, the basic finishing procedure is to spray thin coats, build it up, and then at some point you need to sand it flat and then polish it. So, um, yeah, if you've left any li little lumps and bumps, you try and sand it flat and then you get what we call a rub through, which is where you basically sand through the colour into the bare wood. Or even if there's no colour involved, um, it can still look different when you repair it. If you spray over it again, you've got this patch where it always looked like you can always tell you rub through. So we try and avoid rub throughs like the plague. We avoid rub throughs like COVID-19. Topical? Yeah. Topical, eh? That's enough politics then. Yep, let's do a couple of questions. All right, so, um, uh, well, actually, they're more like comments, so let's get them out of the way. Uh, first of all, um, Bill has, Bill, Bill Flood has more than three routers. He's counted them. He's obviously not given us yep, a full Yeah, Bill was on a mission. Um, Mike Abbott has it's, noticed... This is because um, routers has come up as a, uh, a subject on the forums. If you go to the guitarmaking.co.uk, you can join for free. If you've got any questions, then we're all there answering your questions. Um, um, I practically live there. We all love it. So, um, yeah, at the moment, there's a bit of a debate going on about routers. I always recommend you get a small one, a quarter inch router. Um, but yeah, if you want to know what that's all about, head over the, to the forum and you'll see. So yeah, nice one, Bill. Okay. Um, um, you can never have too many routers. <laughs> Right, Grey Hart is back. He, remember he had a, he had a Hi, Grey Hart. Good um, to have you back. Missed and, you last week. Well, he, he's, the hurricane wasn't too bad. Oh, brilliant. Um, and, but what he said is his, he's a drywaller. That's right. what he does for a living. Oh. And getting things flat is his business. Right, so, right, so you'll be good at this then. Right. Um, Mike Abbott has noticed that you've built a bookcase. It's an old bookcase that we found. Um, what I'm doing is I'm building up to my 5,000 subscriber special, you see. So... When you get to 5,000 subscribers, you've got to have a YouTube bookcase. It's the law. I've read it. I've looked it up. It's the law. So you'll notice the bookcase might expand a little. And these are all trinkets and bits and bobs that people have sent in. So, yeah, one day I'll talk you through the bits there. And uh, if you guys want to send me any nuggets of gold or <laughs> diamonds, then that's where you'll see them appearing. All right. It'll be on my bookcase. If Don't send do sandwiches. Um, right, and the last comment. Clint in Hawaii, Clinton says that he dislikes sanding. So this is a good place to start. Oof! <laughs> yes. I don't think anybody likes it, but it's one of those um, necessary evil. Um, I always say as a guitar maker, you have to learn to love it. Love the one you're with. <laughs> um, yeah, there are certain tools which can help um, help you on your love affair with sanding. Sanding by hand, especially if you've got a carved top, um, can be problematic. Hard work and um, less than good fun. So I'm going to get started. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the session today, this will be all sanded up nice. Um, we could put a finish on it and glue the neck in after the finish.
or we could glue the neck in and spray it afterwards like we normally do. But this will be ready for um, spraying by the time I've finished. So we better get on with it. So there's basically there's flat bits and round bits. And um, there's rough sanding and final sanding. So rough sanding would include any kind of shaping. So if you've got any kind of lumps and bumps, anything that isn't the exact shape you want it to be, then rough sanding is where you get it out. So rough sanding is 60 grit or 80 grit. And then any finer than that, 120, and we go to 320 grit for wood, um, is what we call final sanding. So we have rough sanding and we have final sanding, two different stages. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll rough sand and then we'll drill all the holes and do any little bits and jobs that are left to do and then we'll do the final sanding. So sometimes there's a reason to stop in between and check things and do kind of stuff before you do your final sand. Um, but I mentioned the grits of sandpaper there, so let's just talk about sandpaper. This, this is kind of like the most common sort of type of sandpaper, I would have thought, just standard. Mm -hmm. I buy it on a roll. Um, I'm not an expert on sandpaper. So I'm not going to be able to tell you the exact materials they're made of and everything there is to know. Um, there's Google for that. But what there is on, um, this goes for us guys in Europe anyway, is we have a P number. Um, I know that uh, in America it's slightly different, um, but it's not that much different. What you basically need to know is that the lower the number, the rougher the grit. So the P number is what we're interested in and 60 to 80 grit is for rough sanding. Anything finer than that, 120, see they've all got a P number. Um, this is actually American but it's got a P number on it. Um, that's what we're interested in. So if you're buying sandpaper you'll probably need, I would buy 60, 80, 120, 240, and 320 and then you've got everything covered you could skip the bottom grade and the top grade and just go for 80 120 and 240 i say 240 this american stuff comes and it's, it's actually 220 but 240 or 220 is is pretty much the same it's hardly any difference can I ask a question now? yep you can ask a question uh, so mike, mike abbott saying is it made of sand um so sandpaper is not made of sand. Um, it used to be, I guess it has been in the past, and you'll probably have heard of glass paper as well, where they used, um, probably used chips of glass. That's all quite old fashioned stuff now. I'm not exactly sure what they use now. It's like um, carbide or something, incredibly tough. It's a lot tougher than it used to be. Um, Yeah, I was going to say something else. And I've forgotten what it was. Uh, it'll probably come back to me at some point. Yeah. Um, so this, they, they do use different materials. This gold stuff, uh, I don't know what it is made of. Top secret. Aluminium oxide is another one they use. Um, there's a sandpaper called Free Cut, which you'll find, which is grey. That's also excellent stuff. Um, but the main difference between this and this for me this is 80 grit and this is 80 grit, right? The main difference is that this is self-adhesive. So you can buy self-adhesive sandpaper, which is really handy for making blocks. So any piece of scrap wood can be used to make a block. You just stick your self-adhesive sandpaper on, rip it off, You've got yourself an awesome little tool. Um, we use um, sanding blocks a lot. We use them for cleaning up inlays. In fact, um, Carol's made a little slideshow. We'll maybe play you the slideshow at some point. Um, some examples of sanding blocks in use. Um, but anywhere where you want to sand something flat, then you use a flat sanding block. Any old flat piece of wood will do. 
just scrap MDF. You can also make a curved block. Um, this is an old piece of pipe, just a uh, water pipe, or I'm not sure what it is actually. I found somewhere. Roland's in the house. <laughs> Hi, Roland. Um, so, what I did was I, I cut it that way and then cut it again. So, I cut it in half and half again. Cut it in half and then half again, and I end up with these. So this is like um, a curved sanding block. Still got the, I just cut that this morning to show you. Um, so curved sanding block, again, you can, you can stick your double-sided, uh, you can stick your um, self-adhesive sandpaper onto that. And this could be, block could be any shape. That's the beauty of the self-adhesive sandpaper, is you can make blocks any shape you like. Um, you can even make sharpening stones with this, as I showed you on a previous video, making sharpening stones. Um, and if you don't have the self-adhesive paper, here's another little trick. You can get your normal sandpaper and you, you just wrap it round. Let's do it this way. Wrap it round and then you put another block on top and that holds it holds it nice and tight for you. So we've got another sort of kind of sanding block for sanding this kind of area. So this, I carved this this morning and it's a little bit lumpy bumpy. So really good idea to get the roughest paper. Well, this is 80 grit. I could use 60 grit, but um, walnuts, um, Walnut's actually not so hard. It's it's um it is a hardwood, but it's softer than say maple or mahogany. It's easier to sand. Um, you can actually scratch with your thumbnail this stuff. Don't know if you can see that. Where I scratched it just there. So you have to be careful with it if you're doing an oiled finish. Of course, you'll always be wearing a mask when you're sanding. I'll be putting that on in a second. So there's a little demonstration of how we can clean up that area there. And um, of course, we're gonna use 60 or 80 grit for our rough sand. And we go over the whole body and we don't even touch any other sandpaper until I'm completely happy that it's as perfect as I can get it with the rough paper. So I'm going to use 80 grit um, for the most part. Uh, I probably won't need 60 grit, but I've got some over there if I do need it. Um, I'm going to start sanding this to 80 grit, rough sanding it, getting the flat bits flat and the round bits round. I'm trying to remove any marks that I've put in with, um, with my carving tools. all those kind of marks and these black marks that's those are marks that are put in by the router the routers left those marks so when I route, rounded this radius so um, I'm going to show you how we do that by hand first and then I'm going to get out my super duper sanding machine okay Carol's got a question I've got, well, it, um, I've had my hand up um, uh, TV 101 has said have you had experience of using Abronet a brunette, yes. Um, uh, it's excellent stuff, but for me, it wasn't hard wearing enough and it was ripping badly on these sharp corners. Some of these sharp corners, it was ripping up. Um, a brunette, if I'm right, if I think we're talking about the same thing, it's a, it's a kind of paper at least when I had it, it fitted onto my Velcro um, sanding base. Um, and it kind of like, it's like a net of sandpaper. So it's got lots of big holes in it, which allows um, the dust to clear. 
So it's excellent for really rough sanding where you've got a lot of dust. Sometimes the dust can get clogged up on the sandpaper. That is one of the major problems with sanding is quite often your sandpaper, it gets clogged up long before it gets worn out. Um, as we're on that subject, I'm going to show you how to unclog your sandpaper. If I can find my, yes, here it is. So um, this could save you an absolute fortune. This is, um, I call it the magic rubber. It is, um, it's called abrasive belt cleaner. So I use this on all my machines, my sanding machines. Um, but like I say, usually your sandpaper is not worn out. It's just clogged up. Put on overhead. All right. Camera two, please, Carol. It's a bit closer. So if you look at this, I'll zoom in a bit more on that. So this sandpaper has been used, um, but I bet it's not worn out. I bet it's just clogged up. So you use the abrasive belt cleaner. Look at that. Brand new piece of sandpaper. It looks brand new. It feels brand new as well, actually. So, um, especially with these rougher papers, they can just get clogged up real quick, especially with rosewood and some highly resinous woods. They can get clogged up real quick and uh, just cleaning it with the abrasive belt cleaner can save you a fortune in sandpaper. So there's, uh, that's a good tip there. Abrasive belt cleaner. Um, Here's another type of block, a cork block. So sometimes you don't want a super hard block. Um, you need something with a little bit of give in it. That's when you'd be doing like a curve. So some of these curves, if you used a hard block like this, it might dig a groove. So a cork block is really good. Harder and harder to get though, these kind of things. Um, you can also use rubber, use a rubber block and um, and if you haven't got any of them things then you can just get your rough paper, double it up or treble it up and that makes quite a fairly rigid block for doing curves. What you're trying to avoid really is, especially with this rough paper, is you're trying to avoid putting finger grooves into your um, workpiece. So you want your flat bits flat and your round bits round. Can I take these flat bits before you move on? Yep. Okay, so um, lots of interest. Uh, first of all, I'm positive that you know, where did you get that rubber? Clint Clinton in Hawaii says, where did you get the magic rubber from? Well, I got mine from um, a place called um, Axminster in the UK. They're a, a kind of like a, a hardware store. Um, but I'm sure wherever you are in the world, if you um, Google abrasive belt cleaner, abrasive belt cleaner, then you'll find um, something resembling this. It's just a big lump of... Um, yeah, I've, I've been told by sort of old woodworker fellas that uh, you can use... Um, an old garden hose is the same type of plastic um, but um, I'm using big sanding machines and I like to have a great big lump that I can use to keep my hands well safe but apparently um, a carrier bag an old carrier bag if you scrunch it up apparently that works as well I've never tried that but you, you could try that right, we've got some so TV uses his hoover yes yeah, so obviously keeping your sandpaper as clean as possible helps but sometimes, especially with resinous wood, it gets really caked on there and your hoover just won't suck it off. So you, a, abrasive belt cleaner is, uh, Rock and roller nine is the trick. says, could you use a wire brush to clean sandpaper? The problem with a wire brush is that it's probably going to blunt your sandpaper as you're cleaning it. So yes, you can. I've done that as well. Um, but it, you kind of end up with a second hand piece of paper instead of a brand new piece back. So. Um, it kind of works, but not as good as the magic rubber abrasive belt cleaner. Before you move on, then, can um, somebody asked earlier on about um, you know the, uh, the the pipe 
could that be used as a radius block? Not really, no, it's too tight. Um, I guess if you could find a pipe with a 12 inch radius on, then, then yes. But you'll probably find it's easier to buy an actual radius block. Um, yeah, that's what this was earlier that I was showing you. Um, worth every penny. This one's a 12 inch radius. You don't need a radius block though, you can do it just with a flat block. I go through all that um, on the online courses. So I guess as I've mentioned it, I'll, I'll uh, do the spiel now. So for the past four years, we've been putting together um, the Guitar Making Academy, which um, contains design and build your own acoustic and electric guitar. So it's not just cobbled together for the, um, you know, for the lockdown, just to keep us busy. I've been doing this for years and um, for years before I've been running courses, people come to my little workshop from all over the world, um, as you guys in the comments will testify. Um, and um, in five days or eight days, depending on the course, or 12 days or even longer, depending on a guitar for the acoustics, um, people come and build their own guitar here in the workshop, but not everybody can get here. So we decided um, to try and film it. In fact, we did, we filmed the whole process from start to finish, starting with a blank piece of paper um, through the whole design process until you're playing your finished guitar. So um, I believe anybody can do it. In fact, I know anybody can do it. I've had over 400 people here in the workshop and um, hundreds of people online who are all building using my basic methods that you can use to build guitars at home. So I recommend that you start with something basic like this, but you don't have to. Um, head over to the website and have a look on the forum and you'll see what people are doing. All kinds of crazy stuff. So um, I'm there to help if you get stuck and uh, that's what this is all about. So at the moment I'm trying to put together this um, basic guitar making techniques and we're on number eight, which is sanding. But I have done already a complete build, um, the Lockdown Lucy special, which we did recently. Um, so if you're interested in any of that guitar making, guitar building, repairing, then make sure you subscribe, like and uh, share it and all that kind of stuff because it does really help and we're we're rapidly approaching our 5,000 subscribers um, When we reach that point Well, I want to get this little series of basic guitar making techniques out of the way, but then after that we're gonna get um, We're gonna up our game and we're gonna be doing all sorts of spec more spectacular stuff So if that's what you're into then yeah, make sure you subscribe so you don't want to miss any of that so what I'm gonna do next is Carol's gonna ask a question in a minute, but any minute now I'm going to start sanding. I'm going to show you the basic procedure to go through and sand this by hand and then I'm going to do it with the machine. Zzz. I'll show you a few different machines. Okay, so let's have a few quick questions and then I'm going to get on with well, it. Well it's more, more of a comment before we move on in that, that um, for the first time today we've got joining us Mark Matula and Adam Crofts, they're in Australia, it's half past ten at night. Um, but they were just saying Hi, that folks. They, they've been watching your back catalogue. So this is the first time they've joined us live. Brilliant. And they're really in, enjoying it. So yes, well, that's partly what I'm doing as well, is I'm building kind of a binge-worthy, hopefully binge-worthy back catalogue of stuff. Um, so that when people do happen across us, then there's plenty of stuff for them to watch. So it's our... Um, the Guitar Revolution on YouTube. <laughs> Roland said, phew. We thought that when, when you get to 5k subscribers, you were going to say that you were going to auction this guitar. No. <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that, Roland. <laughs> right, so, um, when I'm doing a guitar like this, I would usually do the flat bits first. So the flat bits would be the back, and believe it or not, the sides I would call flat because, well, this, this is flat this way. Um, it's not, I want to keep this as flat as possible. I'll show you what I mean on the close up there. This, this bit here needs to be flat, and not rounded over. Um, any rounding over at all, then I'm just wasting energy. I'm over sanding it on the edges and it looks nasty. 
So I'm going to show you how we do that. Start with the flat bits and a flat block. I might use my cork block to sand into the corners like this. So this is what I would call an internal corner. Just zoom out a bit. An internal corner like this. And what I would do is I would go in from one side, in from one side, carrot's fine. And then turn it round and in from the other side. Like that. So, a little bit of that to do internal corners. You sand in from both directions. You got that, Simon? Hope you're listening. So we do the same on the other side. Now I'm not gonna completely go until this is perfect because it, it could take hours. I'm just gonna demonstrate, okay? And again, this is an internal corner in there. And these are really tricky. So you might wanna get something smaller, like a broomstick. I use a broomstick with sandpaper wrapped round or a length of a broomstick. Something small and round, a big fat pen or anything like that. Um, Carol will throw me a big fat pen in a minute. Thank you. So if you haven't got the self adhesive, you just wrap it round like this, nice and tight. And then away you go. I believe it or not, once in the guitar factory that shall not be named, I was faced with a pile of 20 bodies, a stack of 20 bodies, and I had to do all these internal curves here all by hand in one day. You'd think they'd have a machine, wouldn't you, for that? Yeah, I have actually got a machine for that. And so I'm gonna show you that right now. Sorry, Simon, but this might upset you. But um, if Carol, if you could just point the camera. I'm gonna show you some rather upsetting tools today. If you're, if you're stuck sanding by hand. then you're not going to like this. I'll see if the uh, camera reaches, it doesn't reach. Oh well. Okay, so just a quick demonstration then. So this is what I call my up and downer. As you can see, it goes up and down as it spins, and then um, it leaves a, a smoother finish. It uses more of the sandpaper. So this is awesome for sanding those internal corners on the edges. And um, there's a few other jobs I use this for. Um, if you join up on the course, you'll see me using this to make the acoustic bridges and uh, some other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, this is what I call my up and downer. It's an oscillating bobbin sander. So um, not cheap. They didn't even have one of these at the factory. I had to do it all by hand. Um, so it's one of the first tools I bought when I started my own workshop. <laughs> you can imagine um, how much time it saves. And there are different, um, you can get different size bobbins. And um, obviously it's great for getting into all the little tight corners. Okay, so an awesome tool for sanding the edges. 
So I like to do the tricky bits first. So sanding the edges is probably the trickiest bit. Sanding round the back, you can use the, um, the, the bobbin sander for everything. Um, but I usually put it down on an edge like this and then work, and work my way around. around. This, this way. way. Maybe overhead, overhead cam. cam. Yeah, there are various makes, various other makes, um, but what you're looking, looking for, for is an oscillating, an oscillating bobbin, bobbin sander. sander. It's, called it's called an oscillating, an oscillating bobbin, bobbin sander. sander. So, so continue, continue all the way around. around. Now obviously no, it's, it's going to take, take you a bit, a bit longer, longer than this. this. I'm, I'm not. not I've, just I've just given it a quick sand, sand so, there's so there's still, still some, some um, what we call uh, router marks. Um, let me see if I can show you some defects. So these marks are router marks, these black marks. So you've got to go until they've all gone and you want all your scratches to look the same colour all the way around. That's when you know it's the same. That's when you know it's done. Um, so you need to get it looking pretty perfect before you move on to the next grip. So round the edges first and then, we, then what I normally do is the back and I always finish by doing the front last. So the front is um, a bit of an echo, that's weird. Let me just check that. Uh, the front is obviously the bit, the most important bit that you see a lot and um, we like to protect the front as much as possible, which is why I do it last. Apparently there's a bit of an echo, so I'm not, uh, I don't Bill, think it's us. Bill Flood reckons it's on the close-up camera. All oh, right, okay. Uh, Yeah, no, it can't be. They're all using the same. Okay. EP says it's gone now. Oh, no, he's right. Mm. Right as well. Got it. Cheers, folks. Fixed it. <laughs> Does it, like, it sounded like you stomped on the delay. Yeah, well done. Bill got it. It was on the close-up cam. Uh, I can set the audio to follow the camera, see? And at the moment, I've got, I'm, I've got a microphone strapped to my belly. <laughs> my chest. That one there. And that's the main mic which is supposed to be for all cameras. So thanks for pointing that out, Bill. Um, well spotted. Can I, can Green Mirror 555 says he's just done the search, and he's found a tilting table bobbin sander, is that yep. the same? Yeah, most of them, the tables tilt, so you can, you can sand at an angle as well as straight. Uh, you know, mine the table, you just loosen it and the table will move. Uh, so um, most of them do have a tilting table. So yes, that's a good option. Um, so I'm gonna sand the back flat now with a flat block. Now, this is what I was going to say earlier and I forgot. When you're sanding, um, every book will tell you to sand parallel to the grain. So, while well, that's impossible. Look at the grain on this. It goes, the grain on this goes there. So, if you do what it says in the book, I'd be sanding like that or something. Well, that's crazy. What I'm going to tell you is always sand parallel to the centre line. However wild and crazy your grain is, ignore it. Always sand parallel to your centre line. And um, this is on wood, by the way. Um, on wood, you always sand parallel to the centre line. And we've got to keep sanding until basically we've removed any marks and scratches from the, from the previous... Um, operation. So flat bits flat with a flat block. You do have to watch your fingers in these holes. You can you can actually cut yourself. These edges can get pretty sharp. So be careful. Are you keeping up Simon? There we go. Um, and a few marks left on there. Now what I want here, on my calves here, is I, I want this to be a nice crisp line. What I try and do is try and make this as flat as possible this way. Um, might even get, 
like a, a little straight edge on it, just to get it as straight as flat as possible. Yep. Um, and then what happens is, what happens is you get a nice crisp line here. And then right at the end, we'll just roll that over, make a nice smooth rolled shape. So to start with, I like to get it a nice crisp line here. You can only get that if this is flat and this is flat. Yeah, the masks work better when they're on your actual head. Yep. Always mask up. Always wear your mask. Also has the added benefit of stopping you getting the lurgy. So you, hopefully... Oh, you keep wearing it? Yeah, you have to have it on your face. So hopefully you can see that little line form in there. So if I carry on, I'll get a nice crisp line all the way around. All the way around that curve. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Doesn't have to be perfect, but um, as you get better at building, um, you do try and perfection is everything really. We're aiming for perfection. You have to aim for perfection, but realize there's no such thing. Now, sanding is, um, this is really one of the things that can set you apart from, from a factory job because um, they really just can't pay that as much attention. Um, if you look closely at a factory job, especially in here and that, I bet you'll see um, scratches. You'll see scratches and uh, all kinds of marks if you look closely on your factory job is. Um, and if you do a bad job on the sanding, it's gonna look terrible. I'd say it's like a drop of water, magnifies everything by five. So if you've left a little defect, it's going to look five times worse when you put the finish on. So sanding is really, um, you, you do have to learn to love it, as we were saying earlier. Um, but it is the, one of the things that can set you apart from um, a cheap looking guitar or an expensive guitar is often just how it's been sanded, believe it or not. I mean, anybody can go and buy an expensive piece of wood. but. Um, but to, to finish it properly, it needs to be sanded properly. And with that fake, and treated with that properly. Fake, yeah, you can get, um, you, you'll probably have seen the photo finish wood. Um, no, the fake, it was, a, it was a fake make and the person sprayed it, but they hadn't, they hadn't sanded. So you see all the rust sawing through the Yeah, thing. actually Gibson did a, nearly unfinished or something, didn't they? Which was just straight off the machines, barely sanded, that's what it was called. <laughs> they did a barely sanded version. That's just lazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's finished then, isn't it, Roland? Barely sanded. <laughs> Charge extra for that. <laughs> yeah, he says that's fine, fine then. Uh, Jim McMillan's on it, Mark. He says he's made a non-oscillating bobbin sander using two inch thick wooden wheels, an old drill and stand, Fantastic. a broken screwdriver and some sticky sandpaper. <laughs> and he said it's fine for cost. Right, well I want to see pictures. Put <laughs> yeah. pictures in the forum, please. I want to see pictures of that. Even a video, if you've got a video of it working, that would be great. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of thing. Um, I wonder if I've got handy. No, but, oh yeah, here was, here's one. Here's one, look, that I've bodged up in the past, um, which has got the radius on it. So I actually made a drum sander with the radius on it for the fretboards. And we could we cover that with 60 grit sandpaper. You can actually radius your fretboards using that. So yeah, you can make your own sanding tools, why not? Um, uh, Clinton in Hawaii is saying um, he spends countless hours sanding, but it takes him countless hours to muster up to start. Yeah. <laughs> It's all in there though, isn't it? You've got to think it through first. <laughs> think it through, spend, spend a week thinking it through and then 10 minutes doing it, isn't it? <laughs> right, so I'm just going to do a quick overview then. Hand sanding, using blocks as much as possible. I use block at every opportunity. You'll rarely see me just sanding with just my hands. I'll always use a block if I can. So we do the flat bits with a flat block, sanding into the internal corners, a 
cork block helps for roundy bits there. We're trying to keep that as flat as possible here. And the rest of the flat bits with a flat block. Other shaped blocks that you can make yourself. And then on the front, we're going to use like really folded up to get right into these grooves here. And just remember to always go parallel to the centre line, whatever anybody else tells you. The thing is, even if you do leave a scratch that's parallel to the centre line, um, they're really difficult to see. Whereas if you've got a scratch going across, they look horrible. Really, anybody can see it from a million miles away. So always sand parallel to the centre line. And was it Simon asking earlier about rounding off? I'm going to make sure I leave this sharp right until the last kick of the ball. So any edges that I want to leave kind of like this, what I'll do is um, I'll I'll round them off just with the very last grit of sandpaper. Um, 240 grit. Carol, can you put that camera back how it was, please? Thank you. So, you get the idea. And cork block to blend it in. You can use your little round blocks, wrap it round a pen to do these bits. So right now I'm going to show you um, how you do this, this is how you do it by hand. I'm going to show you how I do it with my power sanders. Although, once you start, it's hard to stop, isn't it? It is hard to stop. I'm going to stop myself. And um, yeah, that's basically how we sand by hand. And these, these little divots here are done. Um, just what I do is I use a nice sharp corner of my sandpaper there like that. And again I'm going parallel to the centre line. Just like this. Remember, there's going to be a knob covering most of that, so don't worry too much. You know, you don't want to sand it to destruction. Um, but something like that. For sanding the dishes. That will make your fingers sore. Um, yeah, I did show you the... I'm going to now show you some uh, machines for sanding. So, you saw some of you guys, if you were watching on Wednesday, you'll have seen this. This is um, like a miniature, it's my Dremel, and I've made a little miniature end for it. This is uh, just made from an old one of these. So this is my, um, the pad of my power sander. And they come with um, different grits of sandpaper, obviously. But they also come with this pad protector. So your pad can get worn out as the Velcro gets um, mashed. So it's really handy to have a pad protector so you can just rip it off and replace this part. Um, so what I did with, I had an old one of these and I just cut it into a circle and made my own little, um, little power sander with replaceable things. And I can just get a bit of Velcro sandpaper and uh, just cut it into a disc and then it's replaceable. 
So that's a miniature sander that I use for sanding these dishes in here. Can I just do this yet? Okay. Of course, when you're using any kind of sanding tool at all, any kind of power tool, then you've got to be um, super careful because you can um, you can do a lot of damage. Obviously, sanders eat wood. That's their job. Go on then. Well, Some questions, good. and then I'm gonna no, get my main sander out and show you that one. And this is a good point for this. So. Um... Someone asked, um, the Roland asked, where, where do you get the self-sticking sandpaper from? But then you start to about the Velcro, so what, what options are there? So where do you get self-sticking from? And, you know... Okay, um, there's been various improvements over the years. Like, for instance, the, the Velcro pad saver, that's, to me, that's a relatively new thing anyway. So I used to hate Velcro because it was expensive, then pads were more expensive, and doing the kind of stuff I do, they get worn out real quick, these pads. Um, so I used to prefer to use, um, well, I still use the sticky ones. So these discs are available sticky as well, um, with a foam pad. So this is what I prefer. Um, for me these are disposable so they wear out I'll probably use more than one per guitar so um, a lot of car sprayers and people who repair um, metal panel work and that kind of thing they prefer the velcro stuff because you can do you can do a little job with it like a 10 second job change the pad and go through the grits, if you see what I mean. Um, whereas I tend to use more, more discs than pads. So um, I prefer the sticky ones. And they're cheaper to buy. Um, I get the gold stuff from America, Stu Mac, Stuart McDonald. Um, but you can buy self-adhesive paper in the UK from our pal at Tone Tech. Um, it's grey, it's not the gold stuff, it's the grey stuff. Um, I think the gold stuff is actually the best sandpaper that you can get, bar none. But the, the grey stuff is like almost as good and it's, um, you can get it from the UK. So if you don't like ordering from America, then uh, you can get self-adhesive stuff called Free Cut from the UK. But this is gold 3M, which is... Um, if you want to win an Olympic medal at Sandin, you need your gold sandpaper, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. And these are also available as discs. I get these from um, just a place that supplies car. Yeah, the paint, it's the paint shop, the paint section of a car supplies. Yeah. You'll, there'll be one in your town, um, a paint painter supplier for cars. And they, they use these kind of machines and tools all the time. And that's where I get my discs from. So I'm going to put on an 80 grit disc. 80 grit disc. Onto my power sander. So as I say, this comes with um, a pad on it, which you can change. I use a sticky pad, but I could change it for this Velcro one, which I do sometimes use. Um, I'm going to stick with my sticky one for now. So as I say, I like to do the sides first, then the back, and then the front. Um, the only thing I didn't show you how to do by hand was sanding the radiuses. Um, so I'll show you that now before I get the sander going. So when you're sanding these radiuses, I sand it as if it's a 45 degree facet like this. So first like this, as if it's a facet. Then you're left with a line at the top and a line at the bottom. Line at the top, line at the bottom. So we sound, sand around the side to 
take the line off the bottom and then we sand over the top to take that line off the top and we should be left with a nice round looking radius I'll show you that again I'll show you on this back bit so um, we sand it as if it's a chamfer first and then we sand around the side and then over the top parallel to the centre line at all times so hopefully you can see that's a reasonably nice curve there I've still got some router marks to clean up on the edge um, but I'll do that when I'm doing my power sanding so you saw me power sanding in these bits here internal curves on the power sander over there on the drum uh, what was it called the bobbin sander but this is my favorite sander that I use all the time this one's a Merca um, you'll find that if you google it um, it has a separate transformer which is over there um, it's, it's, it's over there underneath the bench, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little transformer under there. Um, so that means that they can, they can put most of the gubbins outside of the machine. And then this is just some incredibly powerful motor. I don't know how they've, they've made it in such a small space. Um, by putting most of the gubbins outside of it. So I, I don't know how it works, but it's the most powerful sander you'll ever see. Um, up until they came out with this, sanders were twice the size and really heavy. <laughs> so they were a nightmare to use. Um, in the factory, we used um, an air sander, which is powered by air, obviously. But um, the problem with that, I've, I've misplaced it temporarily. I've got one somewhere. The problem is you need a really big compressor to power it. And that's out of the means of most people. Um, my compressor is actually on a separate electrical circuit so that it doesn't blow the whole system when it switches on. Um, it's quite a big one. Um, you, you'll struggle to get a big enough compressor to power an air sander. So I don't recommend air sanders, although they are awesome. You're not gonna have a huge compressor like me. I recommend um, one of these. This is like the best sander money can buy. I'll show you another type not to buy. So here's what you'd probably all recognise as a sander. One of these kind of things. Don't even bother with these. Um, I'd call that a finishing sander. So it can be useful for really fine sandpaper, doing fine work when you're, when you're spraying and finishing. Um, but for woodwork like this, You'll be there for weeks with that kind of thing. I wouldn't even bother with that. I'd rather do it by hand, to be honest. So, I'm going to fire up the beast. Just before you do, um, yep. the EP said, would, would adhesive craft spray on the back of normal sandpaper work, don't you think? And I was saying that we, we used to use that. Yeah, I used to use that, um, like spray fix, to 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 stick your sandpaper onto a block. Um, obviously spray fix, it's not cheap, it's expensive. Um, and in the end it worked out cheaper to buy the actual sandpaper. You can also use your um, double-sided tape. I quite often do that. In fact, this, um, the, the self adhesive stuff starts at 80 grit. So there isn't a 60 grit. Um, if I want to use 60 grit, then I'll actually stick it on with double-sided tape. So that's another option. That's reusable as well. And in, in this case, if you keep it clean, I can stick another piece straight on. And it's ready to go. These radius blocks, they are expensive, but if you're building more than one or two guitars, then the time they will save you is totally worth it. Awesome piece of equipment. 
Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're working on um, making our own version of these at some point in the shop. So look out for that. Right, now I'm going to fire up the beast and I'm going to sand with 80 grit this beautiful piece of 400 year old walnut. <laughs> so the old meets the new. Mask on. So I'm going to sand around the edge first. Um, sorry, I'm going to do the edges first and then the back and then I'm going to do the front last. So Carol's going to try and follow me on the camera because I'm going to be moving pretty fast. I'm going to start on the edge here, Carol, overhead cam. This will probably take me about 10 minutes to do the whole thing. sander now to match this radius around there. I can actually use the sander as a shaping tool. Uh, you're not really supposed to but you can. So I'm just going to copy this radius round using my sander now 
uh, and then I'll whiz around the rest of the radius, flip it over and do the front. Mm, so the yeah. Yeah. We'll do some questions when I've done that. <laughs> for a beginner. In fact, I don't let people use my sander when they come to the workshop. Um, I use it. If we're in a hurry, I'll get my sander out and use it. But, um, but I don't let other people use it because, well, as you've seen, it eats wood. That's its job. And you can really do a lot of damage quite quickly with it. <laughs> so um, by all means, get your own and practice with it. Um, it's an awesome tool certainly makes sanding a lot more fun um, but but yeah you, it does take a bit of practice you might notice as i'm going around um some of these awkward bits sometimes it, it the the sander will slip off and then when you come around again it slips off in the same place and it starts to create a track and you end up it makes it really difficult not to slip off in that place again so um yeah it does take a little bit of skill but um yeah, I've been doing it for a long time, so practice makes perfect. <laughs> Place this thing because uh, it keeps falling off, but we'll get there. I'm gonna do this front, yeah. I'm halfway there, I'm nearly there. Looks beautiful, doesn't it? See the shape really starting to emerge. 
what I do is I go round, I did the flat bit at the top first, and then I go round the edge here, like this, as much as possible. And then to finish off, I'm going to blend it in by going across the top like this. You'll see that. Starting to look good. Some questions. Um, okay, so a um, couple of things. Um, earlier on, there was a bit of discussion, and um, I think it was Andy, I'm not, I think it was Andy uh, Adam um, asked about: uh, uh, Is this a random orbital sander? Is this what we? Yes, that? exactly. Yeah. Did I say that? I'm not sure, but that's what he was asking. Yes, it's a random orbit sander. I meant to say that if I didn't already, um, well said. And and then there was a discussion about palm sanders. So um, yeah, well it's both. Right, so that's what. So they're both. A palm sander basically fits in your palm. Um, this one, uh, it's got a lever on the top to control the speed. I can actually I put it on slow by just pressing it a little bit. You might also notice the extractor comes on automatically. That's on a switcher. Um, I'm going to do a video on that at some point as well. Uh, the war on dust that we had recently, uh, where we tried to make it as dust free as possible in here. I've got a, I've got a, f a giant air filter up there, which is sucking dust through like a giant mask. So um, I do as much as possible to mitigate the dust. In here. We can't have it on whilst they've yeah, it's not on now, because um, it makes a lot of noise. So but you can also you can also make a bench, which a vacuum bench, which sucks the dust away from you. We've got one in there in the finishing room, which I'll show you at some point. Um, but yeah, vacuum sanding bench is a brilliant idea. Uh, basically, keep it as clean as possible, as dust free as possible. It it preserves the sandpaper as well as preserving your lungs. So the more you can extract the dust, the better. It keeps it out of the way of the tools and sandpaper and also out of the way of you breathing it in all the time. One of the hazards of guitar making, I'm afraid, is dust. And most of it is carcinogenic. We treat it all as carcinogenic. So um, ebony and rosewoods and the wenge and all that kind of exotic stuff. It's all very bad for you, breathing in the dust. So wear masks. Got any more questions? Uh, Great Heart says, does the sanding bench work well? Depends on your um, extractor. There's different types of extractor. There are chip extractors, which move a large volume of air slowly. And then there's dust extractors, which move a small volume of air more fast. 
so they're better for removing smaller dust out of the air and stuff like that. So yeah, just bear that in mind. If you've got a big planing machine, you want a chip extractor. But if you've got a sanding bench, you probably want a dust extractor, different things. But, um, but they do work, yes. Um, in the factory that shall not be named, I did all my work on a sanding bench. Um, what I was going to do here was, um, there's a couple of little knots that are going to need a bit of attention. I'm going to use super glue and wood dust to, uh, to fill those. So I'll maybe use a pencil just to get me, get me glue accurate. It's not close enough. Let's get a bit closer. Where am I? Where the hell is Yay. it? Here's a little knot. Um, ordinary wood filler that you can get from anywhere is, is brilliant nowadays, but it doesn't come in all the different colours. So what I'm going to do here is use super glue and the actual dust from the wood itself to fill that little hole. So there should be some plenty of dust around. Just get some out of that hole there, put some on there. Super glue, and this is accelerator for super glue. Makes it go hard instantly. Wow, there's a little preview of the colour. Hey, Look Marlon at that. Just, he wanted that. He's been asking you. For Look that. at that. Woo. So then, obviously, that needs to be sanded flush. It might not work first time. Sometimes you have to do it more than once. Gone. It's gone. As if by magic. Look at that. So there's a uh, a couple more of those. Well, there's one there anyway. Maybe one there. But apart from that, this this is pretty good. Actually, there might be some shakes in the wood there. These are going to have to be fixed, a couple of shakes, super glue. But to all intents and purposes, this, this is now ready for um, final sanding. So I'll maybe just tid tidy that bit up a bit. And then we'll move on to final sanding. Beautiful. Right, the good news is that rough sanding is the hard bit. Final sanding is just a case of getting the scratches out that you just put in. And, um, you know, if you stick with the same brand of sandpaper, it shouldn't really matter to be honest, but um, each preceding grit is designed to take out the scratches from the last one so it happens almost instantly so this is what i i use as my medium it's a 180 grit and i use this for a uh, sort of a medium and then i've got a fine and i always go over it by hand to finish it off as well but um let me just show you um how quick this is because we've done all the hard work now done all the shaping and the rough sanding, so we're kind of on to final sanding now. Where's my mask? What do you think then, Roland? Happy with that?
see if we get back on. Because I missed a bit. That's all right, you can always go back. be super careful there that I don't slip into the hole. So I'll do the back. as well with the machine. I showed you how to do it by hand. This is, so we do the same thing with the machine, it's just a bit quicker. it's done with a machine I always go over everything by hand afterwards so with 240 grit or 320 just the last thing is just to go around to take off any sharp edges we also take off any any of these sharp edges around cover plates um, cover plates and yeah, the holes at the front, like the humbuckers, but the neck joint we leave that sharp because that's going to be become part of the neck joint. Um, I've got a question. So th this this um, it's going to be sanded one more time before it gets sprayed um, with the with three twenty or two forty. Um, and there's still a few little bits that need fixing. There's one there. So uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with the whole thing. But what I will do as a bit of a finale is I'm going to give it a squirt and um, show you what it looks like, what it will look like when the finish goes on. Um, 
It also, it might show up some defects. So um, it's not a bad idea actually to just um, give it a squirt. You can just use water and it will show up any scratches. Um, but I'm just gonna use this, uh, actually I will use water if we've got water. No peppermint spray. Um, can I ask you these questions before you do that? Go on then. Right. So, um, Some water. So before you do that, Grey Hart asked a really good question. He said, Grey Hart said, um, the, the ran when you're using the random orbital sander, um, uh -huh. do you stick to the, you know, you said about the centre line and, and sanding along the... Like, no, the random orbit sander rubs out its own scratches, kind of. Um, it does leave what we call zaz marks, which look like circles doing that. They, we call them zaz marks. But um, what we do is the very last thing is just, um, as I said, is just to wipe. I, I always go with by hand. The very last thing by hand is to wipe with the grain like this. And that gets rid of any last little zaz marks. Uh, I say with the grain, I meant parallel to the centre line. Whenever I say with the grain, I mean what I mean really is parallel to the centre line. Because as I said earlier, look at the grain on this, it's wild. Look at the, grain. the grain goes all over the place, so you can't really follow it. Now, with my guitar maker's eye, I can see all sorts of wonderful figure in there. You, you learn to see through the surface into the wood. Um, I can still see quite a few defects on it, which will probably show up when I put the water on. But, um, but that's one of the reasons to do it. So I'm, I'm going to give it a wet in a minute and then you, you guys, we can all appreciate the beauty of this 400 year old walnut. But it also, it might show up a few defects. And um, later on, when you guys have all gone, I'm going to go over this all again with a fine tooth comb. And there's, there's still a few bits I need to fill. And uh, obviously I'm going to make sure this is absolutely perfect before we do any spraying. Just so you know, Roland. But can I tell you, it's, it's, it's half two. So, so is this, this is going to be the finale, isn't it? Right, yep. Thing. Right, but there's a couple of questions that are relevant. So way back earlier on, Mark Matula in Australia, he asked, um, what grit would you do, would you sand to if you were going to oil a body? If I was going to oil it, then you can sand it as fine as you like. Um, I would use, I'd go to at least 320. But if you were oiling it, then you can go right through the grits, right up to however fine you want. Um, and it will just look shinier and shinier. Uh, kind of a workshop situation, we would probably go to maybe 320 or 400 and call it done. Um, and the last kick of the ball before we spray is always um, wire wool. So sometimes we use real wire wool, sometimes we use artificial wire wool. Um, but this just kind of puts the last, takes out any last tiny little scratches. I think this is about equivalent to about 400 quid. That's what we use, is um, Scotch Bright artificial wire wool grey. Okay, a couple more things before you do the finale then. So, um, Grey Hart said, should we also raise the grain with water several times before we use the finish as well? No. So raising the grain, you only have to raise the grain if you're doing a water-based stain or a water-based finish. You might notice if you wet a piece of wood, wait till it dries and come back, you'll feel a rough patch. And that is where the grain is raised, what we call raising the grain. Um, the reason we do that sometimes is if you're, um, it's usually maple that we do it on. And it's usually if we're using a colour. So remember what I was saying earlier about spraying and flatting. Um, by the way, I'm working on a whole course on finishing, which is coming up. Um, I've got to get this series out of the way first, but guitar finishing is top of the list of upcoming courses. 
So I'm going to be covering all this and in um, in great depth. Okay, but but just to just to answer your question briefly, um, let's imagine you're doing um, maple and you've stained it red, and then you're spraying it. Um, when you put your water-based stain on, it raises the grain, and then you put your sealer on, and then if you flat it back, there's a chance that you could knock the top of the grain off, and you end up with these little white dots um, where you've taken the stain off. Um, so to avoid that, what we do is we raise the grain first. So you dampen your piece of wood, so you wet your piece of wood, completely wet it, and then you, um, you wait till it dries, and then you sand it with your finest paper again. Then when you put your stain on, the grain doesn't raise. So that's why I said no, when you said should we raise the grain several times, is the grain will only really raise once. Once you've raised the grain, that's it. You knock it off, and then you just carry on with your finishing operations. Um, wetting it twice won't really do anything. So, so building on from that, because um, uh, one the other question, I'll ask it super cancer if you half answered it. Is paint thinner okay to use to tack clean off dust after sanding? Yeah, it's just a bit nasty. So we don't splash it about unnecessarily. Um, I would rather use what we call we call a tacky rag. So you can buy, they're called tack, tack rags or tacky rags. A tack rag is basically a sticky rag. And um, hmm. I don't know what, that, what it's coated with, but you wipe your surface down and all the dust sticks to your rag. Um, so that's what we use in the, in the finishing shop. And we also use the, the compressed air just to blow all the dust off it. That, that also helps a lot. Um, so yeah, don't use thinners on it. Uh, it will work, but it's just nasty stuff. Your your face will go red and you'll start sweating and uh, hyperventilating. Well, and someone else is, so um, a guy, Rick De Natal, who I've not, not noticed his name. It's also before. a nerve toxin, by the way. Uh, Rick De Natal says, I was thinking naphtha versus paint thinner versus water. Uh, What's the, I suppose he's asking what are the, so you've just said about Yeah, well what I'm about to do, I'm about to splash water on it. Now, you can do that once, but you don't want to be doing it more than once really. Um, the water will dry within a few minutes, it'll be dry in 10 minutes time, 5 or 10 minutes. But you don't want to keep piling water on, obviously. Um, wood's like a sponge, so it will, it will absorb some of it. Um, you don't want to continually keep wetting it. So the advantage of something like thinners or naphtha is that it obviously it evaporates a lot faster. Um, it won't soak into the wood so much. Um, naphtha, by the way, for us Europeans is lighter fluid. Oof. As far as I know. Um, that's what we use. You can't buy naphtha in the UK, but you can buy lighter fluid. And it's, as far as I understand, it's the same stuff. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, internet. I'm sure you will. But I smoke and use it. Just... <laughs> um, so I think I think we're ready for our big finale. My belly's want? rumbling. My belly's what telling me we're ready. What camera do you want? To be on? All of them. Oh right. So where would you like to start, though? I don't know. Whatever you think looks best. I think um, I think two. I'll just show you before I do it. I normally, I normally leave this till, like I say, the last kick of the ball, especially if I was doing like any kind of colour or fake binding. But someone was asking about the rounding the corners off. So just before I spray it or put the last finish on, then we, we just round this edge off all the way around. So sand it as if it's a chamfer and then knock the line off the bottom, knock the line off the top, parallel to the centre line. And you get this kind of, it's not a sharp edge, but it's not 
rounded either, so it's kind of like hand finished sort of edge, just to take the uh, the worst of the sharpness off. You can round that off as much as you want, or as little. Something like that. Don't know if you can actually see it. Try this other camera. Yeah, so it's just not sharp. It's it's finished. Instead of sharp, it's got a nice roundedness of, to it. Beautiful. Right. So that's it. We're doing the finale, right, uh, Roland. We're ready. <whistles> Brace yourselves, folks. That's drum roll. Um. So yeah, wood. When as you're sanding wood, it gets whiter and whiter, um, and they call it in the white. So this piece of wood is what we would call um, in the white now. So it's kind of been sanded, although, as I was saying, I'm going to go over it um, in finer detail later on when you lot have all gone, just to make sure it's perfect. But this is what we call in the white. And you'll notice when you sand with finer and finer paper, your wood gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Some people say, oh, can we leave it like that? And I wish you could, but you can't. The idea of putting a finish on is, um, is to protect the wood from dirt, your skin, grease and dirt, and changes in the environment. So the finish is really, it, it's not just there to make it look beautiful, it's doing an actual job as well. But this is just for demonstration purposes. I'm just gonna wipe on some water. I'm not gonna soak it. I'm just gonna dampen it down. Just to show you, this gives you an idea of what it will look like when, um, when we put the finish on. Ready. I'm not going to do the whole guitar either, I'm just going to do the front. So, um, drum roll please. Can't do, it do the cameras, Carol. <laughs> right, what do you want? Which... <gasps> Whatever looks good. Ooh. So, I always say when you put the finish on, it goes two shades darker. Wow. Maybe more than two shades in this Look case. But you can see how. That's basically what it's going to look like when it's got a finish on. Whether it's an oiled finish or a satin or a gloss, the colour will look pretty much the same. But um, a gloss finish definitely brings out the grain more than a satin or an oiled finish. So there you go. Look at that. Remember when you were just a bit of wood? Do you remember that, Roland? When it was just a great big bit of wood. Look at that. Wow. Oh, it's nice. Wow. Shine the light on it. <gasps> right. So, I think my work here is done. Um, as I say, that was just a basic overview of sanding. There's lots of other different types of sanding. Um, we sand our frets, so we're polishing our frets, which is metal. I didn't want to get into that today because um, I didn't think there'd be time. I wanted to get to this point here. Um, so keep a, an eye out for upcoming. Um, we're here every Wednesday and Saturday. 1 p.m. is our time. So we're here every Wednesday and Saturday doing something live. Um, so upcoming is, I'm going to do um, gluing and clamping. Probably do them in the same video. We're going to do soldering and I'm going to do some stuff on um, getting things flat and level and something on um, fretting. And then that'll be this, this series complete. Then we're going to move on to um, um, some other really exciting stuff, not least of which is going to be our, our finishing course. So make sure you su subscribe and like and share all the YouTube stuff really helps us a lot um, as we um, hurl towards our 5,000 subscriber special. So um, thank you so much for watching guys, especially if you've watched right till the end. Um, hopefully uh, that little treat at the end was worth sticking around for. Um, I'll just give it another little go just to, just for the fade out. So. Remember, the most important thing, 
is, um, oh, by the way, if you want to support us, you can become a supporter member on the website. If you head over to guitarmaking.co.uk, you can become a supporter. If you want to get on the full courses, then you'll have to become a premium member. And then you get access to all the courses, design and build your own electric or acoustic guitar online. Most important thing when all is said and done is to check twice and cut once. So thank you guys. Look at that. Wow. Beautiful. All right. Thanks guys. I'll see you. Um, I'll see you on Wednesday at one o'clock. Check twice, cut once.